Well, I guess it's time to talk about the live-action Yu Yu Hakusho. To be honest, I'm kind of torn. Not because I think this is a great adaptation or anything, because I certainly don't. I'm torn because there were moments in this iteration that made me go, damn, that would have been great in a more faithful version, but also moments that made me think, that actually wasn't half bad. Before we hop into a proper discussion about why I feel the way I do about this series, I want to go ahead and give a huge shout out to the many wonderful people who continue to show their support over on Patreon. A special shout out to Celestial Tier backers, Super Sunset, This One Snack, and Angus Clydesdale. If you'd like to see videos early, see your name in every video, or snag a portrait for the credit scroll, head on over to the Somewhere Past Never Patreon page, which is linked below. If you can't, that's perfectly alright too. A like and subscribe are also great ways to show support for the channel, and it's totally free to do so. Also, I'd really appreciate it if you guys could head on over to my gaming channel, Saturn Pass Never, and check out some of my stupid little challenge runs and leave a subscribe. It'll help greatly, and I'd love to hear what challenges you'd like to see me do. I'll have a link in the description, and there should be a card somewhere on screen. I hope to see you there, not to mention, if you're a patron, you'll get to see videos early from both channels and appear in the credit scroll for both channels, so that's neat. Last, but certainly not least, if you like the avatar I've been using lately or enjoy the artwork for the thumbnails on my gaming channel and need some work done for any of your own projects, I cannot recommend enough my good friend Uka. She's incredibly easy to work with and has a real talent for nailing down ideas you might have based on general descriptions of what you're envisioning. Her commissions are currently open and I'd love to know that I was able to help out someone whose art I enjoy. You can find her socials in the description, so please give her a follow and get something made. She's trying to get a drawing tablet to help her produce art faster, so let's make that happen for her. Especially since she's the artist I'm working with for the Three Kings project. Better drawing conditions for her means that the project can happen even the slightest bit faster. With all of that being said, let's get down to brass tacks. As usual, you should check out Netflix's live-action Yu Yu Hakusho for yourself to draw your own conclusions. Art is subjective, and how I feel about a particular piece of art might not reflect your own feelings, and that's alright. Let me be as clear as possible. If you enjoyed this series, that's genuinely nice to hear. I'm not here to explain why you shouldn't or why you're wrong for enjoying it. I just want to explain why I didn't overall, even if I did enjoy certain moments or aspects. What doesn't help anyone and doesn't make the fanbase look good are gatekeepers and defensive apologists. On one hand, it's important to let people enjoy media that we might find mediocre or even bad. That's their prerogative, and if the piece of art they're consuming connected with them on some level, nobody has the right to tell them they're wrong for having a positive opinion of it. Just because you may not like something doesn't mean it's okay to blind yourself to moments where praise is deserved. On the other side of that aisle, it's just as important to allow people to be critical of media that others find good or even amazing. Criticism in good faith typically comes from a place of seeing that something could have honestly been better with more time, care, or polish. What you shouldn't do is take those criticisms as personal attacks and deafen yourself to genuine issues. Regardless of whether you really enjoyed the live-action Yu Yu Hakusho or you absolutely despise it, keep in mind it is still a piece of art, and your subjective opinion about it does not make you better than anyone else on the other side of the aisle. With that in mind, I do have a more critical opinion of this particular depiction, but I'm going to walk you through why I feel the way I do. A question I've been trying to answer since I finished my first watch is, who exactly is this for? Like, who is the intended target audience? Because for the life of me, I cannot figure it out. There are far too many references that aren't explained for it to simply exist as a way to create new Yu Yu Hakusho fans. For the people that have never heard of Yu Yu Hakusho that give the live-action version a chance, they very likely won't understand why the fandom for the anime holds it in such high regard. And if those people double back to watch the anime, they'll probably sour on this version once the scope of the story they were cheated out of comes into full focus. However, there are far too many elements of this beloved series that are mangled, reshuffled, and stitched back together in the form of some hideous Frankenstein's monster abomination for genuine fans like me to look past and appreciate on a base level. There's surprisingly very little here for fans of the source material to appreciate aside from a checklist of fan favor or iconic moments the showrunners want to point to to be able to say, hey, remember this? Wasn't this cool? Now I think before we get rolling, it's important to make a very clear distinction between an adaptation and a reimagining. An adaptation is a movie, television show, or stage play that is rewritten into a new form from a written work, typically a novel. A reimagination is a reinterpretation of an event, work of art, etc. With those terms clearly defined, Netflix's Yu Yu Hakusho is more of a reimagining than an adaptation. Hell, it feels less like a reimagination or an adaptation and far more like a games done quick speedrun. To fully articulate why my stance is what it is, I'm going to take you play by play through the 5 episode series. Don't, don't look at the runtime, so that I can properly discuss the few things the show does right, what it gets very wrong, and how it ultimately results in a show that's aggressively mediocre once you reach the end. 
I do need to and am going to be comparing the live action iteration directly to its anime counterpart because I want you to understand why the show fails on its own merits. This is less about boohoo, this isn't a one-to-one -one creation, and more about how the story itself suffers as a direct result of the compromises that were made to rush the project out the door in the form of a five episode run. So this is your spoiler warning for both the live action and anime versions of Yu Yu Hakusho. I'm going to be talking about both pretty extensively, so if you haven't seen them, at least go watch the anime. But let's dive into it. But first, a word from today's sponsor, the chill folks over at Universes, a unique trading card game that's given me the opportunity to unveil their latest booster set based on the Dark Tournament. This set is exclusive to local game stores that offers reprints of cards from the previous Yu Yu Hakusho set, as well as tons of new cards from the iconic tournament. I didn't know too much about Universes when I was contacted, but it felt genuinely awesome to open packs of cards and recognize every single moment the cards are from as a fan of the series. Each pack in the set contains 12 cards instead of 11, which made pulling that surprise card so much fun. The artwork for the rare cards is well done, eye-catching, and does a great job of making you curious about the game itself. I was even lucky enough to pull an extra secret rare variant of Genkai's Guidance, so my luck was apparently pretty good. I opened nearly the entire box on stream and had a good time talking Yu Yu Hakusho with everyone, and even had some members of the community in chat that were familiar with universes filling me in on details. As I said, you can obtain your own packs of Dark Tournament cards from your local game stores, and you can participate in special release events where you'll construct decks to pit against your peers, competing for alternate art promos and play mats. Winners of these release events will receive invitations to the Universe's online wish tournament on their Discord server where the prizes just get even better. Aside from going out to get these exclusive packs, which you should do to support your local small businesses, you can go sign up for an account on the Universe's Game Network website and type in my channel name in the content creator box located in the section underneath How Did You Hear About Us. Doing so will net you 50 player coins which you can use to redeem free promo cards inside the UGN store, and 50 coins is enough for almost any card. You can track your progress, locate tournaments, and accrue player coins to redeem for even more free cards. So if you'd like to support the channel and your local game shops, head on over to the UGN and sign up for an account and then get out there to compete in a few tournaments. You never know what new friends you might meet, and hell, you might even run into me! A link to the UGN will be in the description below, and thanks again to Universus for sponsoring this video. Now on to today's nightmare. The episode begins much like the anime with the presentation of Yusuke's death, except Keiko is here to ride with him in the ambulance. It takes him a while to realize he's dead, which is partially because he's just kind of walking around like everyone else and not hovering in the air. After he realizes he's on Danny Phantom's hit list, we flash back to earlier in the day when Yusuke and Keiko share a brief conversation on the roof to mirror the one at the start of the anime. Although a detail that stuck out to me after this scene was the fact that Yusuke's classmates are all wearing the same green uniform that he is. This might seem like a nitpick to some, but this trait in the anime served as character for Yusuke's views and attitudes in regard to the rules. Just like all the boys have to wear blue jumpsuits, which Ow. I notice you're not. Oh, give me a break, Keiko. He showed the audience that he was rebellious in nature and cared very little about how others perceived his disruption of the school dress code for boys who all wore blue. I also saw people complaining about this depiction of Yusuke smoking, but I don't really understand what their gripe with this is. Smoking has always been seen as an act of rebellion by youth, specifically delinquents or those trying to be cool. Not to mention, it's insanely common for troublemakers to also be smokers. To deny this imagery is to deny a core piece of Yusuke's personality at this point in the story, and it's such a small detail to begin with. When Yusuke leaves the rooftop, he comes across a group of students bullying some poor kid named Kirino, taking his money. When he intervenes on behalf of the student, a teacher happens upon the scene where it appears Yusuke is stealing their money. It's similar to the scene in the first episode of the anime, but reworked in a way I actually think does a good job of showing that Yusuke is actually a good, if misunderstood, person. Shortly after, Yusuke ditches school entirely, but we don't get any scene of him interacting with Takanaka, one of the only members of the school staff we ever see giving a shit about him. Takanaka doesn't make any kind of appearance, and instead, we skip forward to Yusuke going home where Atsuko is watching a news broadcast centered around Sakio, who's talking about a massive sinkhole in the middle of Saryashiki City. You know, a hole that's basically the same as the one that exists in Mushiori City near the end of Chapter Black. So that's not a good sign. Afterward, we get the scene of Kuwabara challenging Yusuke to a fight. In terms of story beats, with a few of the added or repurposed events, it's doing a surprisingly competent job of retreading the first part of the story. We also get this gem of a moment that is absolutely going to be a useful gif in the future. <laughs> One of the things that made Yusuke's sacrifice more impactful in the anime was the time he spent interacting with the boy beforehand. Taking the time to make him laugh and play with him before warning him to keep away from the road because it's dangerous to play so close to it. His interaction with this boy humanizes him after we spent the episode up to this point seeing him as something of a punk and shows us that he's not inherently a bad person. 
Unlike the guy driving the sports car who just wasn't paying attention, the truck driver has been possessed by a Makai insect since the story needs to kill Yusuke and set the groundwork for the trouble to come. There's no room for Yusuke's death to just be an accident because there's no time for those pesky things called plot and character development. I will say that I enjoy seeing Yusuke go into Keiko's family restaurant for ramen, which is why she's nearby when he dies. It's clear that they're trying to build up the relationship between the two of them early, which I do appreciate even if it ultimately falls a bit flat. Though to the show's credit, <laughs> Yusuke getting hit by that truck was brutal. I'm genuinely surprised they not only showed it, but it was that violent. It's a credit I can give to live action in general. They don't shy away from the violence of Yu Yu Hakusho's story. It might not have any real understanding of the themes of the show, but it's got some bloody imagery. We get a brief bit of narration explaining that human world and demon world were once connected before the implementation of a barrier to separate them and protect humanity. This information feels out of place, like it was supposed to be delivered later on in a better written story, but due to where the story intends to go, this is something the viewers need to know right away. Botan finally shows up and she gives off a weird, nervous energy instead of having an outwardly playful vibe where she isn't afraid to poke fun at Yusuke. Like, let's compare these two moments. Which of these iterations of Botan is just more charming? Now I understand what kind of person you are, it's in my guidebook. Rather than be scared or surprised, you yell a lot and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Yusuke Yurameshi, age 14, personality is impulsive and ill-mannered with a violent temper. He has no respect for authority and is a horrible student. Things weren't looking up for you, were they? <laughs> That's none of your business! うん、なるほど。データ通りの性格みたいだね。恨みしゆうすけ<笑><笑> They've also aged Yusuke up to 17, which I get why they do that for a live action series, but Yusuke's age was a big part of the reasons he acted the way he did. He wasn't emotionally mature and often lashed out when he wasn't sure how to process his feelings. That makes sense for a 14 year old kid who never had any positive role models. It also serves to show how easy it is to forget Yusuke as a child who's been thrown into situation after situation with life or death consequences. It's one of the things Genkai realizes when Yusuke is undergoing his final test and she fears the spirit wave orb is going to kill him. Not only does this reduce the growth of Yusuke, it winds back the clock on everyone else too. Look at where Kubar starts versus where he ends. Much more mature and confident and ready to step into the world of being an adult. These characters are forged by the trials they were forced to face as children. But again, given where this iteration is going, it's honestly not that big of a deal. So let's just keep moving. Instead of Yusuke inquiring about the well-being of the kid he gave up his life for and Botan offering to take him to see for himself, the show just cuts to them in the hospital visiting. While this is a tiny thing to remove, it shows that Yusuke was honestly more convinced with saving that kid than his own safety. Even though he was dead and had no idea he wouldn't be for long, he wanted to make sure Masaru was okay. They also leave out the fact that Yusuke's death was so surprising that they hadn't even prepared a place for his soul yet. This leads Yusuke to ask if that meant they'd been expecting Masaru to die, to which Botan replies that had Yusuke not intervened and caused more confusion, the car would have missed Masaru anyway and he'd have had one less scrape on his shoulder in the end. It's one of the funniest reality checks you could get in a situation like that. And Botan even goes on to say, In other words, your death was a complete and utter waste. <laughs> This complete lack of any real idea what to do with Yusuke's soul because of his unforeseen death is why he's even given the option to undertake an ordeal to potentially get his life back. But Yusuke refuses right away, without knowing anything about the ordeal, without there being any world-ending stakes, he just decides it isn't worth it. The lives of the people around him would be easier without him there to drag them down, which is a heartbreaking perspective for someone to have at age 14. In the Netflix version, Botan buries the lead and takes Yusuke right to meet Koenma. Admittedly, I love the visualization of him looking through the scrolls that represent the lives of people who are being judged. It's stylized in a way that feels suitably magical and mesmerizing. I am going to miss the HR paper stamping of toddler Koenma, but that's alright. Once he turns his attention to Yusuke, he just dives right in and tells him that he's resurrecting him in exchange, he'll work as a spirit detective. But I don't understand why, aside from the narrative needing Yusuke specifically, why Koenma would deem this Yusuke a suitable candidate for a job as important and dangerous as spirit detective. 
Surely there are other recently dead people who are more qualified and in tune with spirit energy than Yusuke. Yusuke's original ordeal wasn't about becoming a spirit detective at all, it was solely about gauging whether or not he was worthy of a second chance at life. It isn't until he once again demonstrates his willingness to put others before him by giving up his only means of getting his life back to save Keiko's that such an option even opens up later. His second sacrifice is what got Koenma to see the very real growth potential of Yusuke and return him to the world of the living. Here, Koenma's like, hey, I know you just died and have no real experience in anything and we haven't taught you anything, but you want to chase some bugs? Uh, some demon bugs are hanging out. Go find out why. No leads, no clues, no direction. Just go do the thing. Yusuke refuses, just like he does in the anime, but I probably would have too in this particular setup. It's too straightforward and lacks any of the nuance of the original story. With everything happening out of order, it just feels messy. One thing you can say about the anime is that the emotional pacing is very well done, and that's not emulated here in any skillful way. We switch to Sakio chatting up Tarukane in a casino, and there's a kind of dumb moment where Sakio tells Tarukane to go all in on where he believes the roulette ball will come to a stop. He ends up being correct by some miracle of the universe, which references Sakio's enjoyment of gambling but seems to misunderstand that he's not some savant, nor does he just randomly make gambles without understanding the variables or knowing there's a high probability of emerging victorious. Even Tarukane questions if the wheel was rigged, although Sakio denies that, but just consider how low the odds are of him correctly calling this result out of nowhere. If you place a straight bet on a single number, you're looking at a 1 in 37 chance at best, which translates to a meager 2.632%. Roulette tables are determined almost exclusively by luck pending any tampering on the house's side, and it's not like Sakio had anything to say about why he chose that number. He just does, and the show moves on. Like, it's such a dumb gripe, I know, but it's another in a long list of misplaced or misunderstood characterization. Like, what did we learn about Sakio from this interaction? What did it teach us about how he perceives the world around him? What did it teach us about how he views risk or risk assessment? Ideally, everything a character says or does should teach you more about that character, but we don't get anything of value from this interaction. Trust me, characterization remains a problem for this show, but we have so much to cover and I don't want to get caught in the weeds. So that big, totally not chapter black hole in the middle of the city, Sakio owns that sinkhole having bought it from Tarukane, I guess. I didn't know individuals could own sinkholes, but I suppose you can do anything if you're rich enough. However, according to Sakio, that sinkhole goes down way further than it should and connects right to the demon world, but that's not how that works. Demon, human, and spirit world are all on separate planes of existence, which is why a portal is required to travel between them. Even when humans randomly wander into demon world, it's often framed as accidental due to the periodic thinning of the veil between worlds. And it's exactly why, in this same show, Sakio ends up using a portal to try to get demons into human world. So even when it's placed against the script from future episodes, this comment makes zero sense. If the idea is that he's speaking metaphorically or in hyperbole, there should have been a better way to convey that. Afterward, Botan convinces Yusuke to check out his own wake, and that's where the next scene leads us. We see Kirino coming to pay his respects with an offering, only to be accosted by the same group of bullies as before. Kuwabara comes in to save the day this time, but he doesn't get to say anything poignant to the bullies before his friends start dragging him away. He doesn't even make it into the building before he starts yelling about Yusuke being dead, and all Yusuke has to say is, oh, that moron is here too. It completely misses the mark in what this moment was for Kuwabara in the anime. Sure, he's also screaming that he wants Yusuke to come out and fight him, but through the script, the performance, and even the way a teardrop falls on his hand, we see that this was the only way Kuwabara knew how to go about mourning someone he felt a rivalry and camaraderie with. It wasn't just, ah, stop being dead because I want a rematch. It was Kuwabara realizing that death had claimed one of the few people that gave his life meaning. There's a genuine grief to this version of Kuwabara that's missing from the live action. And I don't know, I just don't rock with this version of Kuwabara. But that comes down to the fact Kuwabara is given very little to do overall and not the performance itself. Keiko doesn't get to have her meltdown during the wake because she has hers in private with Atsuko, who also keeps together during the ceremony. While their private conversation and subsequent mourning is touching in its own way, it lacks that abrasive, gut-wrenching feeling that grief carries with it in the wake of the loss of a loved one, something the anime presented very well. What helped to convey Keiko, Kuwabara, Atsuko, and even Takanaka's sadness so masterfully to the audience was that it was uncontrolled and happened in public. Their grief was so strong that it superseded their ability to keep their composure around others. It's something we all know well, that feeling that you need to wait until you're in the privacy of a safe space to truly break down, but then being faced with such devastating circumstances that holding back the emotions that come with it is impossible. This next point isn't important, but I do think it was a missed opportunity to not go for that amusing glamour shot for Yusuke's portrait. Something about seeing that in live action would have cracked me up. 
The cherry on top is the fact that the original soundtrack that we've all come to love so much is completely absent from this iteration of the story. The only time we hear anything from the OST is when we see the truck driver that kills Yusuke getting frustrated in traffic. Smile Bomb is playing on the radio, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised if you didn't notice it because you were trying to focus on the dialogue. Admittedly, I missed it on my first watch. It was actually pointed out to me by Uka. Aside from that, and please correct me if I'm wrong because I have zero intention of combing through the series for musical cameos, there aren't any remixes or remasters or orchestrations that I noticed beyond this point. It's all very generic Netflix music. I mentioned the music a ton in the notes I took while watching this series, but this seemed like the best time to bring it up. Even if I don't mention it again, just assume I hate the entire soundtrack of the live action. Like, listen to just a few seconds of some of these tracks and tell me they don't ooze personality. Moving on, the bullies have apparently been terrorizing Kirino for so long that the sun has gone down. We learned that the Makai insects possess people with negative emotions and then amplifies them, which is why it chose the kid being bullied instead of any of the bullies themselves. I guess that means the truck driver was possessed because he just really hated being in traffic? Once Kirino gets possessed, all hell starts breaking loose, and one of the motorcycles at the scene begins leaking fuel near a Zippo lighter that the main bully intended to burn Kirino with. There was plenty of time for someone to move the lighter out of the way, but no. This is what causes the fire that ultimately spreads to Yusuke's home, threatening to destroy his body. I will admit, this is a better setup than some random arsonist arbitrarily choosing Yusuke's home to torch. Keiko runs in to grab Yusuke's body and I notice he's still in his school uniform. I thought this was weird until I learned, because I had to search for an answer, that Japan typically cremates their dead, so I guess it doesn't really matter what he's wearing. Y you learn something new every day. Yusuke intervenes personally to save Keiko and agrees to do whatever Koenma asks so long as he allows Keiko to live. But what was the alternative here? Koenma needs Yusuke alive, and for that to happen, his body needs to be intact, right? So the likelihood of Keiko actually dying here would be zero. If Koenma allowed Keiko to die, Yusuke would have outright refused to be revived. The scene only makes sense in the context of the story as it originally was. Yusuke's second sacrifice was an act of selflessness and love for Keiko, relinquishing his fate to uncertainty to protect the person that would make returning to life mean anything. In this version, his agreeing to step into the role of spirit detective feels like it comes through soft coercion. But Yusuke agrees to do whatever Koenma says, he gets revived, saves Keiko, and then runs off to deal with Kirino. Before Yusuke can find Kirino though, we see that Kuwabara and his friends are getting effortlessly steamrolled. We know Yusuke is stronger than Kuwabara, more so by the end of the series than in the beginning, but here it makes Kuwabara appear far weaker than Yusuke. The two may have different talents, but Kuwabara is also a street brawler. The fight between Yusuke and Kirino kicks off and no bullshit, it's incredibly entertaining with a consistent intensity to it. The choreography is engrossing and the camera work, while it can be a bit shaky at times, doesn't cut away to the point you can't decipher what's happening. The jittery and unhinged movements from Kirino during this showdown give it a horror movie like suspense during every clash and every close call. It's probably the best choreographed fight in the show just from how polished it is overall. The added time limit Yusuke is working against to save Kirino before he's completely transformed into a demon gives this set piece a tangible sense of urgency. On top of that, it serves to show the audience how horrific it would be for an entire city to be crawling with Makai possessed. However, while I enjoyed this scene, I do find it a little concerning that Yusuke is struggling against a single, bottom tier grunt enemy. He does ultimately save Kirino, but even Koenma says if that's how the new spirit detective fights, then they're in trouble. And yeah, I'm very much inclined to agree with him on that. We're then made privy to what's in store for Yusuke, being the three artifacts that bring Kurama, Hiei, and Goki into the story. This next part confuses me a little bit. Koenma says they're after you-know-what before showing some generic humanoid monsters that look like someone bought Nemesis from Kmart. Botan's like, oh, Yusuke won't stand a chance against those things, that's not fair. And then we cut to a train yard where those same weird creatures are killing soldiers in possession of the three artifacts? Hiei, Kurama, and Goki show up, drop some bodies and gather the tchotchkes, and the episode ends. But. What were those creatures? I assumed they were cultivated humans, but there's no explanation and they never show up again. Am I 
Am I missing something? The Conjuring Blade, Forlorn Hope, and Orb of Bost all fall into the hands of Hiei, Kurama, and Goki respectively. While I was sifting through my confusion, the credit sequence began, which looked like it would fit right at home on a PS2 game. It's one of the cheapest credit sequences I've seen in a very long time. And that's episode 1. There was a lot to go over, but I wanted to try to give you a solid overview to prepare you for just how much worse it gets. You can argue that the first episode is by far the best episode because while it isn't a one-to-one -one remake, it at least tries to respect the source material. Episode 1 is the Netflix production equivalent of, he a little confused but he got the spirit. Episode 2 falls into this category as well, so let's hop on in. When we start the episode, Goki is out and about enjoying a series of kids meals thanks to the Orb of Bost. For a setup, it immediately gets you on board that this guy needs to be stopped, so it works pretty well. I just mentioned that episode 2 exists beside the first in terms of at least trying to stick to the source material in some way, but even with that being true, we right away start to see threads of the types of changes that begin chipping away at what little goodwill episode 1 had accumulated with me. The very next scene, we pop back in with Yusuke who's attempting to learn to gather and fire spirit energy, or in other words, perform the spirit gun. It's strange to see Yusuke legitimately struggling to pull off a basic technique that he picks up almost immediately in the anime. Koenma and Botan both openly mock Yusuke for his inability to pull off the spear gun, with Botan even going so far as to say if only you were a bit smarter. It's weirdly hostile how they're both treating this teenager who literally just found out about the existence of any of the shit they're rushing him into. What's also weird is that the technique is openly referred to as the spirit gun, but then this iteration of Koenma goes on to mock Yusuke for attempting to channel his spirit energy through the tip of his finger, like, you know, a gun, when it was originally Koenma's idea to teach Yusuke in this fashion because it was easy to convey in a way anyone could have understood. Or at least, that's the interpretation that's easy to take away from the scene because of how clunky the dialogue is written. What Koenma's actually trying to get through to Yusuke is to channel the spirit energy and then fire it with all of his heart, which could be a recognition that spirit energy and emotions are connected, but I think giving the showrunners the benefit of the doubt here would be a bit too generous. He's trying to get Yusuke to stop thinking about using his fingers as the mechanism of which to actually fire the spirit gun, and more as a conduit to pass the energy through. But you can see how that nuanced message could be interpreted either way, right? Anyway, Kuwabara expresses his sadness and assumes responsibility for the injuries of his friends, which does show traces of the Kuwabara we know and love. But it's kind of a surface level trait. It exists within the script not as a way to truly characterize Kuwabara, but to inform his actions in a certain situation later. It's also to fool you into thinking the writers understand him as a character. Kuwabara catches up to Yusuke to ask how he defeated the possessed Kirino, and Yusuke just kinda word vomits everything he just learned all over a character that he has no real attachment to. Botan drags him away to prevent him from blabbing too much, and Kuwabara shows his first signs of relevance by acknowledging Botan's presence to his friends after the pair walks away, all of whom say there was nobody with Yusuke at all. And I purposely phrased it like that, signs of relevance instead of saying signs of spirit awareness, because it is never an attribute that is truly assigned to Kuwabara in this iteration. This is the one time he acknowledges something that he shouldn't have been able to, and it's never touched upon again, not even by Genkai later. We don't even get hints or references to Kuwabara being able to see ghosts. However, unless you're a fan of the source material, how are you as a member of the audience supposed to understand what that means for Kuwabara? This moment, and many others to come, are built on the idea that the person watching it has some general understanding of the plot of Yu Yu Hakusho, and how those characters were originally intended to interact with that plot. Yusuke and Botan spend some time going around town looking for Goki but find no leads, so Yusuke decides to go get ramen because you can't fight evil on an empty stomach. Much to my surprise, Masaru, the boy he saved at the beginning, is waiting there with his mother to thank Yusuke personally. Then, Yusuke is given a lead through Masaru's mother who remarks that her son has been a bit on edge due to the string of collapsing children outside their apartment complex. I really like that this was how the showrunners chose to pivot Yusuke toward the plot, by bringing back a character that is alive because of Yusuke, but also has a tangible reason for their potential proximity to Goki's endeavors and the victimhood that comes with it. It's one of the few clever bits of writing I'm willing to praise here, so good job! Naturally, Yusuke takes this information and heads off to find Goki, where he happens upon the demon right after he's gathered the souls of more children. This leads to a brief chase that funnels right into this episode's big fight sequence that's both dynamic and relatively entertaining. So far, the fight choreography for these battles have been refreshingly creative in terms of how often elements of the environment are implemented into the sequence. It's not the most complex series of back and forths, like this isn't the raid or anything, but for what it is, it works. Goki's CG is hit or miss at times, but overall, I thought it was fine. Yusuke comes very close to getting got here the way he does in the anime, and right before things get grim, he's saved by Masaru, only for Goki to immediately steal the kid's soul. 
As Goki gears up to eat the kid's soul, Yusuke finally manages to queue up and fire off the spirit gun directly into the demon's open mouth, ending the battle. Once again, I do not enjoy just how hard Yusuke is struggling to utilize a skill he easily acquired in the other mediums. The limitations to the number of times he could fire the gun per day was a fine way to mitigate the speedy acquisition. Once that's over, we get our first glimpse of Yukina where Tarukine manages to get a tear out of her, which I found weird since when we originally meet Yukina, she's walled herself off to physical pain to avoid giving Tarukine any additional Hiroseki stones. That's why he calls in the Tagoro brothers in the first place. The guy that's referenced in the anime who initially tries to set Yukina free is also here, but uh, he won't be for long. Now we come to one of two major moments in this episode that I very much did not enjoy with this first instance being Hiei using the Conjuring Blade, which is closer to a dagger here, to give himself the Jagan Eye. I genuinely hate this change because it removes so much from Hiei's history, his motivations, which we'll circle back around to in the final episode, and shuts the door on his connection to Shigure. It also removes the explanation for why a demon like Hiei with a vast combat history would be so comparatively weak to other demons Team Urameshi faced over the course of their adventure. Unfortunately, all we can do is just keep moving on, Following the confrontation with Goki, Yusuke informs Botan that Kurama was spectating the fight, who fills him in on what the Forlorn Hope, the object in Kurama's possession, can do. Gulbar is also here, having spotted Yusuke and Botan together and deciding to follow them so that he can eavesdrop on their conversation. This isn't something Kuwabara would do. He wouldn't metal gear around the area, skulking in the shadows, he would just walk up to Yusuke and ask him directly about Botan, which is absolutely what he does during Genkai's tournament when Yusuke and Botan are talking privately about the rando situation. And Kuwabara only interjects because he sees Yusuke talking to a pretty girl that isn't Keiko, but once that's cleared up and it's revealed who Botan is, that's when Yusuke explains the idea of demons, albeit super briefly. Anyway, while Yusuke is out and about, he crosses paths with Kurama, who purposely leads him, and by association, Kuwabara, to the hospital where his mother is being kept. There's a lightning fast wardrobe change for Kurama into what must be his school uniform, but his standard outfit is his school uniform. It's a bizarre choice and it's only ever in this one scene. Literally right after this, when Kurama goes into more detail about his situation, he's right back into being in his standard outfit, so what was the point? A quick nitpick, I am not a fan of the redesigns of the artifacts that the Demon Trio stole. They've had that sense of personality scrubbed away and lack any real distinction between them save for their respective shapes. The Conjuring Blade looks like a fancy butter knife, the Forlorn Hope is just a tablet, and the Orb of Bost is just a stress ball. They pulse rhythmically like a heartbeat though, so ooh, so mysterious. The very designs of the original artifacts gave them an atmosphere of intrigue as if they were truly relics imbued with archaic magic. Of course, Kobara is eavesdropping on the conversation with Kurama as well. It's clear that Yusuke empathizes with Kurama's current situation, so later on when Botan explains that Kurama will die if he uses the mirror, Yusuke naturally wants to intervene. However, Kuwabara gets in his way, actively trying to prevent this. Kuwabara mentions that they just saw a demon burn down someone's house the other day, and he's also still clinging to the helplessness he felt being unable to protect his friends. He goes on to say that Yusuke is under no obligation to do anything for Kurama. This was the second moment that honestly rubbed me wrong. Kuwabara is a deeply empathetic character to the point he's willing to put his own body and life on the line because of the good he sees in others. Yet here, because of the fact he almost got his friends killed by a demon that was clearly not as sophisticated or in control as Kurama, he shows a clear agitation that Yusuke would even deign to help Kurama. And this is after Kuwabara overheard Kurama's explanation for the whole situation. Of all the characters on Team Yurameshi's roster, Kuwabara demonstrates a consistent thread of compassion and humanity, so it feels remarkably out of character for him to prefer someone else die due to spite and prejudice. Kuwabara would not do this. Not to mention, Kuwabara never interacted with this portion of the story to begin with, and as you'll see later, there was genuinely no reason for him to interact with it here either. The only point is for him to learn, oh, maybe not all demons are bad? Which is not a character arc Kuwabara ever needed to go on. Yusuke goes anyway and Kuwabara gives chase, hoping to prevent him from intervening before finally saying that he can't let Yusuke die again. But where the hell does this come from? At no point in the series does it even really attempt to make you believe these two have any real kind of friendship. Kuwabara has had literally no reason to care about what Yusuke does or why. Kuwabara only suddenly cares because the showrunners understand that ultimately these two need to end up friends. But we don't get there organically, these two haven't even shared all that much screen time. Yet somehow I'm supposed to buy the fact that Kuwabara just cares so much. Yusuke offers half his life to aid Kurama, but the way it's framed makes it seem like the Forlorn Hope is literally pulling half of Kurama and Yusuke's remaining years out of them. 
but that could have just been a visualization, so I'm not going to harp on it at all. However, in other versions, Yusuke doesn't offer half his life, he just offers his life in place of Kurama's, understanding how Kurama's mother would mourn her son the way Atsuko mourned Yusuke. The mirror itself is impressed by Yusuke's willingness to trade his life for Kurama's, viewing the act as noble. And as such, the mirror itself chose to split the difference between the two, instead of taking all of the life energy from one or the other. In the English dub, the price is cancelled out altogether. So that's just something the live action gets wrong full stop. In the aftermath, Kubara apologizes, but only says he was mistaken. That's it. That was the entirety of the maybe not all demons are bad arc. Then the two walk off to get ramen, and we're supposed to clap because they're friends now, I guess? I, like, I get it. Yusuke saved Kubar's life and the lives of his friends, but that by itself doesn't make them friends, and we're not given anything else to pave the way for a genuine friendship. But the episode, without credits, is only 39 minutes long, so the showrunners are just trying to cram in as much shit as they can. The showrunners are basically saying, you've seen the anime, right? You've, you've read the manga, correct? Fill in the blanks yourself, you goddamn troglodyte. We already took your money, we've got places to be that start with Toe and end with Goro. The penultimate scene is about Hiei's efforts to track down Yukina with his newly acquired Jagan that I maintain looks stupid. His efforts lead him to the one stone Tarukane has in transport to be sold. When Hiei engages, I couldn't help but crack up because he looks so silly running behind the car and it's giving me CW Flash vibes. Hiei cleaves the car in half, but I don't know how he did this because I'm pretty sure his weapon isn't long enough to pull that off, but it looks cool, right? Right? The episode ends with Sakio offering asylum for Tarukane in the wake of Hiei's seizure of the Hiroseki Stone, which causes the meatball of a man to threaten to back out of his deal with Sakio. This is where the scene from the trailer comes in, where Sakio offers a new job to the Togoro brothers. And yes, I'm going to continue to pronounce it as Togoro because I grew up with the Funimation dub, and it's just ingrained in me at this point. Eat my ass. By the time the episode wraps up, you can see where the cracks have begun to form, and there's a mild hope that even though we're flying through plot points at breakneck speed or ignoring them altogether, that the show will maintain its current level of consistency for the remainder of the episode count. That is short-lived though, since episode 3 does a brilliant job of reminding you that neither the showrunners nor Netflix itself give any kind of actual shit about the integrity of the story, its characters, or why anyone loves the original in the first place. Imagine getting to a third date with someone you were really excited to meet that shares a similar hobby or passion. The first date is a little awkward, but you chalk it up to the both of you just being nervous and first time jitters. You kind of pass the time talking about your shared interest and that's enough. The second date is a bit more relaxed, but you're starting to realize that the person may have misrepresented themselves or maybe you're just not as into them as you thought. They kind of struggle with answering what should be obvious questions or articulating more of their personal feelings about the shared hobby, but you still press on to the third date thinking you're just reading into it a bit too much. But then you reach the third date, and they show up with a clear lack of understanding of the hobby they projected to you so blatantly. It becomes clear that they probably don't give a shit about the hobby at all and just used it as a way to get you to the table. But to cover their bases, they skimmed the Wikipedia page or watched a brief summary that hit on the main elements of the hobby itself. Sure, it's not the end of the world, but there's suddenly a disconnect between you and them. You don't feel good about the situation anymore, and then you remember that there are still two more scheduled dates after this one that you can't bail on unless you quite literally die. So yeah, I guess it's time to talk about episode 3. The episode begins with Yusuke being sent to infiltrate Tarukane's compound alone to retrieve the Conjuring Blade from Hiei. Apparently this version of the relic has the power to just give someone their desired ability. That's a huge change from what it actually does, which is the ability to turn its victim into an E-class demon with just a single scratch, although it doesn't work on other demons, which is why Kurama isn't affected by it in the anime. It's a massive change to the way this item works because the story needed to find ways to bend over backwards to tell this reimagined narrative. This falls into a strange territory where it makes you wonder why they chose to change some details in order to explain things, but left the rest up to your knowledge of canon. There's a brief scrap between Yusuke and Hiei that isn't as stylish or well shot as the other fights we've been treated to. The effect the visuals department chose to go with to emphasize Hiei's speed also doesn't look all that good. If anything, I find it to be a bit goofy, but that's most likely a direct result of the budget. Surprisingly, when Hiei gets the upper hand on Yusuke, he just gives up the fight? I was blown away by this because Yusuke is a stubborn character that would have kept fighting until he figured out a strategy or got beaten down. Which is exactly how he defeats Hiei in the original story, by being stubborn although he was outmatched. Yusuke, as he's been characterized canonically, would have never just surrendered and let Hiei walk away like that. Also, I guess now he can use the spirit gun on command, because he cues it up effortlessly all of a sudden. 
Remember when, you know, one episode ago he was struggling to even focus his spirit energy? What happened between then and now that he's able to perform? If you're going to make Yusuke struggle with a basic technique, at least have the balls to fully commit to it until he meets Genkai. We transition to Hanging Neck Island, where Sakio apparently just lives. When he and Tarukane link up, we get our first reference to the Black Black Club before we get a similar demonstration of power from the younger Toguro as we do in the anime, but with different circumstances. To be honest, this moment does a wonderful job of really pulling into focus why it's so frustrating to see story elements shuffled up so mindlessly. In the anime, Toguro demonstrates his power to Tarukane to convince him of his value, which is all a ploy by Sakio from behind the scenes to go Tarukane into betting all of his money on a fixed match down the road. That revelation is huge in the anime, and it shows how cunning Sakio is compared to Tarukane who thought he was a big shot with a massive payday on the way thanks to having Toguro as the ace up his sleeve. By comparison, Sakio was calm and unassuming, the young member of the Black Black Club that just seemed to be getting lucky during their wagers. But here, all of the plotting, all of the interpersonal conflict and politics is gone in favor of making Sakio a far less interesting antagonist. I will say the CG for the series is fine by Netflix standards. It's never marvelous or masterful, but it's shockingly okay overall. Well, with the exception of a certain pair of antagonistic siblings. The CG for Tagoro's body when he beefs up feels like it wasn't fully polished before the product was shipped, and has an almost Play-Doh-like quality to it visually. Gripes aside, the way he dispatches the Demon Hound was appropriately gory and I thought it was dope. Once this little exhibition is over, Saki and Tarukane go to move Yukina into a more secure cell, but she's currently in the middle of a prison break, thanks to the help of the man who sympathized with her earlier. The two make a run for the helicopter they arrived on, only to be confronted by E.T., who's just chilling inside it for some reason. The Elder Tagoro CG never quite works for me. It always just looks a bit off, like it set up shop in the Uncanny Valley. Sometimes it feels like this was on purpose, and sometimes it just feels like bad CG. Though of all the characters to have mid to bad CG, this is probably the best one for that to happen to given the nature of his powers and the general eeriness and erratic nature of E.T. Naturally, the guy trying to rescue Yukina gets skewered, and to be frank, he did it to himself. I have no idea why he decided to wait until they were isolated on an island where the only way to freedom was a single helicopter. Tarukane draws attention to a monitor where we see a freeze frame of Hiei and Yusuke asking who they are. Sakio only tells him that one is human and the other is a demon, but they're both dangerous. So to ensure Tarukane's safety, he leaves him in the care of Team Tagoro, where we finally get to see Karasu and Bui. It is entirely too early to have them in the story though. Like we haven't even met Genkai yet, but whatever. For the story this version is trying to tell, I'll just let it slide. I will say though that Bui looks fucking incredible. The costume department nailed this one. I can genuinely see people looking at his costume and realizing how cool it would be to cosplay as him, because even I was thinking that. When we switch back to our actual protagonist, Botan tells Yusuke that Koenma is sending him to train with Genkai and Kuwabara just kind of tags along for reasons. That reason being he can't properly call himself Yusuke's rival? These two don't have nearly enough on-screen interactions for this to work as a genuine reason. We've only seen Kuwabara attempt to fight Yusuke once, <laughs> which sure could be interpreted as a rivalry in Kuwabara's eyes. Kuwabara only shows up to train because he also needs to meet Genkai. It would have been incredibly easy for the story to work in that Kuwabara sees ghosts and then have him show up at her compound for the same reason he does in the anime, which is that he wants to seek guidance in regard to his growing spirit awareness. They even demonstrate his spirit awareness with the acknowledgement of Botan, even though they aren't explicit about it. But then we meet Genkai and her outfit looks like they got it from Party City. Something about it just feels off, like, like it's just ever so slightly too big or something. Training begins and the first thing that comes to mind is, why does Yusuke's jacket defy gravity? The answer is clearly because he's not actually upside down on set, but guys, just take off the jacket. Yusuke wasn't even wearing his school uniform during his training sessions with Genkai. Which does make me wish we'd gotten to see Yusuke in some of his alternate outfits, especially the one he wears right after his revival and during Genkai's tournament. I fucking love this outfit. What's even funnier is that Genkai's hair is falling in the correct direction, even though the rest of her outfit isn't. Yusuke fails to stay upright and mocks Genkai's training, not seeing the point in what she's trying to teach him, which is regulating his spirit energy. The conversation leads to a sparring match in which Genkai displays the difference between them and their technique. According to her, Yusuke is trying to emulate Hiei's speed, but that's not the impression I got from him throwing wild haymakers one after the other. At one point, Yusuke mirrors a mid-air maneuver Genkai used against him and forces her to block the incoming attack. This causes Genkai to notice how quickly he was able to copy her. At first I was a little afraid that the showrunners would use this brief comment as a way to just staple new abilities to Yusuke, but then I assumed it was instead a way to show Yusuke's adaptability in combat. We see later that it was the latter, but it only happens one more time toward the end. 
While Yusuke is busy being insufferable, Kuwabara is outside working on his assigned training, which is to break a boulder with a wooden sword. We'll talk more about this in a bit, when Kuwabara actually achieves his task. Elsewhere, Kurama tries to convince Hiei to hand over the conjuring blade so that he can give it to Yusuke, obviously as a show of thanks for his help. In return, he offers to try to acquire information regarding Yukina's whereabouts, but Hiei refuses. To be honest, I don't understand why Hiei even needs the conjuring blade anymore. He gave himself the Jagan, he knows Yukina is in the city somewhere, and the blade doesn't appear to serve its original function. I don't think he ever even uses it again, so what's the point of turning down a potential source of new information about the person he's literally trying to find? It's stupid. We get to see the machine Saki has been pouring his time and resources into, the one designed to open a stable portal to Demon World. Through a brief conversation between Saki and Toguro, we see that at the very least, Toguro's more obvious motivations remain the same when it comes to why he's working with Saki. He wants to go to Demon World because he feels there's no one left to challenge him in Human World. It's a good thing he never made it to Demon World though, or he'd have gotten his cheeks clapped. Two weeks into training with Genkai, and Yusuke is still struggling with the same exercise we saw him doing before. This is also the only spirit energy related exercise we see him doing, and while the anime made it clear that Yusuke did hate this particular task, it's shown that it wasn't the only training he received. After Yusuke fails again, Genkai calls Yusuke out on his lack of true motivation to grow stronger. Botan asks how Yusuke's training has been going, and when Genkai says he's utterly hopeless, Botan replies with, yeah that sounds about right, to which Genkai then expresses her belief that Yusuke won't amount to anything. This is very out of character for Botan and especially for Genkai, who both canonically see the potential in Yusuke. It's weird to see them being so willing to dismiss him without much extra thought. And isn't like this is played as a trick where Genkai is saying this specifically because she knows Yusuke can hear them. She says it, and she walks off, and then we cut to another scene. Those are her true feelings right now. Even when we cut back to Yusuke, it's clear he didn't hear the conversation at all. It's yet another misunderstanding or complete disregard for the relationship between Yusuke and Genkai. Though I guess this can't be helped given we've skipped the entirety of the spirit detective arc to rush into the bastardization of the next couple of arcs. Yusuke sees Kuwabara training diligently, having been at it so long that his palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. Yet despite all the wooden swords he's broken in the state of his hands, he carries on. Kuwabara wills himself to keep training after he collapses by telling himself that a man who can't protect what's important to him is no man at all. Which, yeah, on the surface is a very Kuwabara thing to say, but it lacks the heart of the original character. Kuwabara manifests his spirit sword, which is blue this time around, and is shaped more like a lightsaber than what we're used to. I'm not a fan of this track to get Kuwabara to where he needs to be with his spirit sword because it doesn't evoke any surprise or wonder, nor does it arise from conflict or desperation. It just kind of happens and we're supposed to cheer. I'll just let Genkai explain why this moment is more satisfying in the anime versus him just slapping a rock for two weeks. Normally, spirit energy cycles through the body and is very hard to control. But when his life was endangered, he instinctively used his high spirit awareness to manipulate his energy into a solid object, in this case, into a sword. There's an absence of catharsis due entirely to the included absence of any tangible stakes or the perception of threats. Sure, smacking a boulder for two weeks from sunrise to well after sunset sounds like it sucks, but where's the urgency? Where's the emotional through line that goes beyond, my friends got hurt because the plot needed me to be much weaker than my counterpart and that makes me frustrated. Speaking of his counterpart, Kuwabara's success over Genkai's trial is what pushes Yusuke to grow stronger. It's not about needing to protect others or anything meaningful, it's pettiness driven by the fact that Kuwabara completed his task first. That's it. The next time we see Yusuke training, he's finally mastered that one exercise and Botan says he's been like that all night, remarking that he'd gotten stronger than Kuwabara. This makes it seem like Yusuke mastered it overnight, but the text on screen before Genkai arrives indicates that it's now day 20. So that leaves us with three possibilities. A. Yusuke took six days to get better and Genkai just didn't notice at all. B. Yusuke really did master it overnight fueled solely by spite. Or C. It's a post-production continuity error. The next portion of his training requires Yusuke to fire a massive spirit gun up into the sky, very similar to the one he fires in honor of Genkai before the Dark Tournament finals. At first I thought this was going to be a setup for later so that it can act as an emotional callback, but it turns out it's just another victim of the showrunners wanting to cram as many iconic moments into the series as possible in the event they don't get a second season. On top of that, based on how Yusuke was just struggling, how is he even able to pull off a spirit gun of this magnitude? One of the biggest sins this show commits, that becomes more and more evident as we continue along, is that it's style over substance. Which is a shame because it's the substance of this intellectual property that keeps the people coming back to it. Also I guess Genkai's compound is close enough to Hanging Neck Island that Tagoro saw the spirit gun? But this shouldn't be possible. 
Genkai's compound is located way out in the boonies, to the point just traveling there is an all-day event that requires catching several trains. I can see how this would be a nitpick, but Tagoro could have just as easily sensed it as well as the direction it came from relative to his position and connected the dots. Tagoro shows a bit of excitement and leaves the room, which prompts E.T. to comment that it's been a while since he's seen his younger brother make that expression, so something interesting must be nearby. Right after the scene, Genkai just knows that Tagoro knows about Yusuke? Am I missing something? I genuinely do not understand how she just suddenly becomes aware of this. Genkai gives Yusuke the whole spiel about not sacrificing what he values for power, which doesn't mean anything to Yusuke yet since he's never encountered Tagoro, so it just comes across like a lady reading a wordy fortune cookie more so than a genuine warning about the price Tagoro paid for power. The emotional and thematic tether doesn't exist here unless you're familiar with how this is supposed to go and why. The show is putting a lot of emphasis on Yusuke's desire to grow stronger, which was never really one of his primary character traits. The only time Yusuke ever trained as a direct result of the need to grow stronger was after Team Urameshi was invited to the Dark Tournament, and that was because, one, they weren't allowed to decline or else they and all their loved ones would be killed by the monstrous Tagoro, and two, Yusuke understood that if he didn't get stronger before the tournament, he was bound to be killed. If not by the fearsome competitors, then definitely by Tagoro. He trains in the Spirit Detective arc because that was the reward for coming out on top in Genkai's tournament, a tournament that was only held so that she could find a successor to eventually pass the Spirit Wave Orb to. He doesn't train or get a chance to train at all in Chapter Black, and he spars with Hokushin and the others during the Three Kings arc because they need him to get strong enough to take Ryzen's throne, which Yusuke ultimately doesn't want to do anyway. He only sparred with Hokushin so that he could fight Ryzen for intervening in his battle with Sensui. It feels like they're Goku-fying Yusuke with his sudden, I need to get stronger because the world is depending on me mindset. And then Genkai just hands over the Spirit Wave Orb in the most unceremonious fashion imaginable. She tells Yusuke that the world needs him more than ever and that his training is thereby complete. Uh, first of all, Yusuke has zero accolades or real achievements under his belt. He took out one Makai possessed, which he struggled with. He took out Goki, who he definitely struggled and almost died against. He didn't even have to fight Kurama and he lost to Hiei. What else has he done? This version of Yusuke is a fucking loser that's being given the star treatment for no other reason than he's the main character. By the time Yusuke is faced with the Spirit Wave Orb and the Source Material, he's defeated Goki, Hiei, Baldock the Bat Tamer, Kibano, Kazumaru, Rando, Suzaku, fought the Tagoros once, trained with Genkai a second time, defeated Chu, helped fend off M's 1, 2, and 3, defeated Bakken, and Jin. By the time Genkai is even considering passing the Spirit Wave Orb to Yusuke, which was also out of a sense of desperation on her part, Yusuke has climbed all the way to the semifinals of the Dark Tournament. He's had so much time to grow as a fighter, as a spirit detective, and most importantly, as a person. The Spirit Wave Orb was Yusuke's final test, and it was a brutal one at that, one which could have killed him had he not been through all of his trials and tribulations. Hell, it still almost kills him, and Genkai remarks that even she felt it was still much too early to give it to him. However, the circumstances and looming threat of Tagoro, a threat Yusuke was very much familiar with by now, left her no choice but to have faith in Yusuke. So when Yusuke does undertake the test, survives the horrifying ordeal, and fully assimilates the orb, he's earned that shit. But here, it's just given to him with no strings attached or trials to face. What I can only assume is later that night, Tagoro shows up to confront Genkai. It's very brief and then we cut back to Yusuke who's chowing down at Keiko's family restaurant. When the two go to part ways, Keiko is kidnapped by what appears to be Hiei, and since I know that this isn't Hiei, I'm actually going to just skip over the section of my notes that disliked this. In the context of what comes later, it sort of makes sense. Botan goes to fetch Kuwabara saying Keiko has been kidnapped, but it doesn't even seem like the two know each other in this version of the story. Like Keiko knows of Kuwabara, but I don't think we've seen them interact a single time. So why would Kuwabara care aside from him being an honorable guy? Surprise surprise, we find out that it was the elder Tagoro brother disguised as Hiei that kidnapped Keiko. This works because we know that Sakyo knows Yusuke and Hiei are at odds, even if they don't know the reason. So making sure Yusuke sees Hiei run off with Keiko works. What doesn't necessarily work for me is the intended outcome. If they wanted Yusuke to come to their island so that he could fight, I understand kidnapping Keiko. But using Hiei's face would and does send Yusuke in the wrong direction. They only end up going to the correct destination because of Kurama's sleuthing. So if Kurama hadn't gotten the information and passed it along, Yusuke and Hiei would have just kept fighting among themselves in the warehouse. 
It makes no sense, especially since I don't recall any moment where anyone in Sakyo's camp shows awareness of anyone other than Yusuke and Hiei. Anyway, when Kurama informs the two that Keiko and Yukina are being kept at the same place, Yusuke and Hiei lock in a truce and they set off. Kuwabar shows up because the plot demands that he's also there. He's quite literally got zero motivation to tag along since it's not like he has seen Yukina yet. Kuwabara is essentially the annoying younger sibling that refuses to stop following you around. The newly formed team head to a dock where they're welcomed on board a ship by one of Sakyo's nameless goons, and they set sail for the island. The last bit of the episode is that Genkai dies off screen. We don't even get to see the showdown between the two, which was pivotal in demonstrating just how daunting of an obstacle Tagora was even for someone with decades of experience like Genkai. And it's not like this is specifically a fake out, Botan and Koenma confirm this in the next episode. Then again, since we know and have seen so little of Genkai, watching this fight play out wouldn't have had the same impact anyway. As you can see, episode 3 is where the red flags from the first two episodes evolve into a full-blown alarm bell. It's mostly downhill from here, and episodes 4 and 5 are where I personally feel the train completely derails and kills everyone on board. To really emphasize this, I'm going to combine the final two episodes into one segment, since it feels like a two-parter rather than standalone episodes like the first three. After I talked about the trailers for the series, someone pointed out that Bui and Karasu's presence could potentially be attributed to the two of them extending invitations to Hiei and Kurama for the Dark Tournament in the same way Toguro did for Yusuke. To me, this was a solid and viable explanation that I thought would be intriguing to see. However, that hope was dissipated when at the beginning of episode 4, Kurama refers to their predicament as a possible tournament, a response to one of the goons on the ship saying Keiko will be returned to Yusuke if he defeats a demon. My hope went from, this is the pre-tournament setup, to, uh-oh, is this going to be what takes the place of the tournament? Sakio demonstrates that he's an absolute lunatic by loading a revolver with 5 rounds and then somehow not blowing his brains out. I'm not sure what they're supposed to be going for with this iteration of Sakio, but something about it just isn't gelling with me, and that's likely because it clashes with every Everything I've come to know about Sakio as a character. Soon afterward, Botan and Koenma confirm Genkai's death, and weirdly enough, while I like this set that was designed and chosen for the spirit world scenes, I do kind of wish we could have seen Koenma at a desk stamping papers with ogres bringing in even more documents. The bureaucracy of it was funny in its own way. Interestingly, during the previously on section, the narrator says that Genkai was assassinated by the younger Tagoro who trained under her. But, and again, correct me if I'm misremembering, Genkai and Tagoro were equals, not master and student. Hiei splits off from the group, and when the remaining three arrive in a warehouse-type setting, Kurama is set upon by Karasu. There's an unintentional hilarity to Karasu asking Kurama if he uses hair products on what is very obviously a mid-tier wig. Kurama sends Yusuke and Kuwabara off, telling them that he'll take care of the new threat that just appeared. Kuwabara is like, don't you dare die, but as was the case with Keiko, he's got zero attachment to Kurama in any fashion. It's like he and the showrunners are hoping we forgot that the last time the two were even interacting with the same plot, Kuwabara was actively trying to prevent Yusuke from saving Kurama's life. But now we're supposed to buy that he cares? It comes across as disingenuous from a character that's supposed to be the most genuine in his compassion for others. Elsewhere, the fight with Bui kicks off, and even in action, his costume design looks fantastic. The choreography here isn't super elegant, but it's got a heftiness to it. It does a great job of making you believe there's weight behind each of Bui's attacks. If I had to criticize this fight, and I will from a storytelling perspective in a bit, I do think the lighting could have been a little better. We see the Black Black Club betting on the fight so far, with everyone putting their money on Bui and Karasu. Tarukone specifically goes all in on Bui, who he's hoping to see put Hiei in his place. To be real, I'm going to skip the rest of the storyline in regard to the Black Black Club because it genuinely ends up going nowhere, which surprised me quite a bit, so we're just going to drop the plot here. Doubling back momentarily, the fights are more dynamic than I thought they'd be. How the action is shot, how it's structured and choreographed, it all works for the most part. However, while it's still cool, the Kurama Karasu battle relies on quite a bit of CG that doesn't always work well, some of which can really pull your focus away from the action itself. Yusuke and Kuwabara arrive at a maze-like compound and immediately split up, even though they have no idea what they're dealing with and neither of them are all that strong or experienced. There was a confidence to them during the original Rescue Yukina arc because they'd just come out on top against the Saint Beasts, but even then, they stuck together from start to finish. We get a brief scene where Keiko meets Yukina, and Yukina heals a small wound on Keiko's hand. This is important for a dumb thing I'm going to complain about later. Back with Kurama, the fight against Karasu isn't going too well. After expressing that he knows who Kurama truly is and then taunting his lack of power in his human form, Yoko is coaxed out. I groaned so loudly when the camera spun to reveal him, 
This is definitely an example of the writers just checking fanservice boxes, regardless of how empty of a gesture it is. What made Yoko so intriguing in the first place was that we'd spent so much time getting to know who Kurama was and what he stood for, so seeing his true form reveal itself and for it to be held in such high regard by the demons around him was fascinating, not to mention the cold callousness of Yoko served as a clear departure from the character we knew. On top of that, the first time Yoko appears isn't because Kurama wills it, it happens due to Yuri Urishima fucking around and ultimately finding out. Kurama had no intention of reverting back to Yoko, and it wasn't until he was confronted with the reality of facing someone as powerful as Karasu that he realized the necessity of his old persona. Kurama recognized that he couldn't defeat Karasu without the aid of Yoko's powers and actively sought out a means of tapping into that, only succeeding after some help from the beautiful Suzuka. So there are layers of storytelling to Yoko's reveal and subsequent return during the finals of the tournament that give his presence gravitas. In the live action, Kurama just does it. Back over with Hiei, Bui begins to ditch his armor so that he can turn the tides, the same thing he does in the anime. Here is my issue with this moment, and it perfectly encapsulates my feelings about most of these matchups too. Just like with Kurama and especially with Yusuke, this is Hiei without any achievements or accolades or anything. This is essentially beginning of series Hiei forcing dark tournament finale Bui to remove his armor. Consider how far apart in power Hiei and Bui are up until Hiei masters the Darkness Flame. Sure, that gap closes over the course of the Dark Tournament, but at best, it's an even fight until the armor comes off. And he has had time and opportunities to improve against lesser enemies. If we ignore the fights with Yusuke, which weren't challenging Hiei in any real way, Bui is his first opponent in this series. So either Hiei is way stronger here, or Bui is far weaker. That's part of the problem of this match, and quite frankly, all of the fights of the finale. The buildup in stakes, tension, and even character strength is completely traded away in favor of half-hearted nostalgia bait. I could also complain about the color of Bui's hair here, but the aesthetic things have very quickly fallen to the wayside when compared to the terrible storytelling decisions that were made. It's the same as with Karasu's mask coming off and his hair not changing, I just at this point I don't care about the aesthetic differences. Switching back to the prisoners, Keiko tricks and overpowers a guard in order to get out of her holding cell. This would be fine if Keiko had ever shown any aptitude for CQC or mentioned taking self-defense classes earlier in the series. It's only afterward that she supposes Yusuke's wrestling lessons came in handy after all. I always hate when writers do this in order to get their characters out of a position they wrote themselves into. Coming up with an excuse for a sudden behavior or skill after doing it isn't good writing. The smart thing to do would have been to have wrestling or self-defense come up earlier, either through some banter between she and Yusuke or just flat out showing her getting those lessons. Another part of this scene that feels out of character for Keiko is her telling Yukina when she's reluctant to leave her cell based on what happened to the last guy, that she'll drag her out by her neck if she has to. Threatening physical intervention against a girl that has clearly been traumatized throughout her captivity didn't feel like Keiko. Back over with the Karasu fight, he's busy dealing with the Ojigi plant, and I can't get over how rough the CG for it looks. It's almost comical how much it stands out. There's also this tiny moment where Karasu dodges just a bit too early and it made me laugh when I noticed it upon rewatch. Unfortunately for Kurama, he exhausts his spirit energy and begins to revert back to his human form, which makes things easier for Karasu. Once again, if you're unfamiliar with the source material, Yoko reverting back into base Kurama just kinda comes out of nowhere, and his passive attitude in allowing the Ojigi to take center stage in the fight instead of remaining actively engaged seems like an intentional throw. You're not given time to see or understand the confidence Yoko has stemming from his history which makes him arrogant enough to choose to toy with Karasu rather than outright killing him. But you're also not given an adequate explanation about how spirit energy works, what depletes it, and how that even ties to Yoko. Kuwabara finally returns to the screen only to get punched in the dick by Keiko when he links up with the girls, where he promptly falls in love with Yukina. In the anime, this is easier to write off as comedy because of how over-the-top Kuwabara's expressions of infatuation are. Here, it's played so seriously and when you tie that with a rushed story and character arcs, it leaves Kuwabara feeling more like a creep than a guy with a crush. Hiei is having his own troubles keeping up with Bui now that he's relinquished his armor, and so the writers decide to tick another box on their checklist of iconic moments when Hiei brandishes the Darkness Flame. If we return to our earlier comparison of it feeling like beginning of series Hiei vs Bui, and we wanted to give Hiei the benefit of the doubt, that would still only push him to being on par with his anime counterpart during the fight with Ziru, since that marks the first appearance of the Darkness Flame and it wasn't on his arm at that point. He had to use his arm as bait to summon it forth and direct it at Ziru. I assume just my right arm will do. Yet here, Hia has the dragon embedded in his arm, which would mean he's mastered it. So this would be Dark Tournament finale Hiei in terms of power, but if that's the case, why does he still burn his hand using the Darkness Flame? It makes no sense at all. Anyway, the Darkness Flame ragdolls Bui and leaves him a smoldering mess of flesh and cosplay foam. Bui tells Hiei to finish him off, but Hiei refuses, saying he doesn't like being told what to do. 
Do you kind of see what I mean about the showrunners just not understanding why these moments exist? I know it feels like I'm being a dead horse here, but it's actually kind of impressive to me that either the writers just flat out have no idea why these moments matter, or just did not care because they were going to get paid either way. In the immediate aftermath of the fight between these same characters in the Dark Tournament, Boy also requests that Hiei finish him off. However, Hiei's refusal to comply was an expression of his growth and development, to extend mercy to an enemy, something Hiei rarely, if ever, did. It wasn't just some too cool for school gotcha moment, it was the end result of the time he'd spent with Team Yurameshi and the traits he'd picked up from Yusuke, Kurama, and even Kuwabara. Without the ups and downs of the tournament itself, this version of Hiei does not and cannot exist. At the end of the fight with Karasu, Kurama tilts the scales in his favor by using the seed of the death plant because there are still things on the fan favorites checklist that we need to mark off. Ignoring the fact that this isn't even how Kurama kills Karasu in the tournament, when the flowers begin to bloom from Karasu's corpse, Kurama doesn't even say the line about flowers! At least give us that! What irony. Such beauty sprung from such an ugly soil. Kuwabara and the ladies come to a dead end with three large blast doors. For some reason, Keiko just starts trying to open them up, throwing caution to the wind. As anyone with at least two functioning brain cells could have guessed, these doors aren't other pathways, they're containment units, and the trio ends up being chased by a hound-like demon. Good job, Keiko. Side note, it's weird that the guard Keiko stole the keycard from even had access to this containment unit, but not the first one Keiko tried to open. Logistically, I don't understand why he'd have clearance to open one cell, but not the others. This is also a nitpick, but Yukina refers to him as Kuwabara and not Kazuma, something she never does in the anime. It sets her apart from everyone else in Kuwabara's life, aside from Shizuru. This was even used to give Kuwabara a second win during the final moments of his fight against Risho when he heard Yukina call his name. It's not the biggest of goofs since we know this story isn't going to have anywhere near the amount of character building and development, it just feels weird. Kurama and Hiei link up and they're both in pretty bad shape. Kurama is limping from his harsh but overall clean fight against Karasu, and Hiei's right arm looks like he left it in the broiler. Neither of these physical limitations come up again. Kurama stops limping almost immediately, and Hiei never expresses any pain specifically tied to the state of his arm, which was a big plot point for him after the first round of the Dark Tournament, with the uncertainty if he'd even be able to use that hand in the foreseeable future. The Dragon of the Darkness Flame is not meant to be controlled. He may never be able to use that arm again. Kubara and the girls come face to face with E.T., and this is where I think the CG is at its most noticeable, but is also still forgivable based on the character it's being used for. Don't misunderstand me, I don't think the CG looks good necessarily, but like I said earlier, for a character like Elder Tagoro, it's somehow grossly appropriate. The episode rounds out with Yusuke finally stumbling into the arena where he'll be fighting Tagoro. Let me remind you, Yusuke has done nothing this entire episode. He's had the least screen time of everyone on Team Yurameshi. On my first watch, I hadn't noticed how much of the episode Yusuke spent off screen, which wasn't uncommon for episodes of the anime focused on the supporting characters, but even in those episodes, Yusuke was still at least near the action in some way if he wasn't participating. He spends this entire episode walking or running toward the plot, while everyone else gets to split off and interact with it in some fashion. The final episode begins with a brief glimpse of the memory of Toguro and Genkai's comrades being slain by the demon Chiron. The fight against the younger Toguro brother begins in earnest and Yusuke is getting appropriately ragdolled. The CG isn't the best specifically for this aerial attack though, however I will admit the CG is becoming less noticeable and I can't tell if that's just because it's actually kinda alright or if I've just gotten used to it. Out with the ladies, Kuwabara is doing surprisingly well defending himself against E.T. When Kuwabara ends up at a disadvantage, Keiko interferes, which draws E.T.'s attention to her. Remembering the helplessness he felt in the first episode spurs Kuwabara into action again, summoning his spirit sword without the use of a conduit. Considering the stakes are very high right now, it makes sense for him to tap into his power in this way. This is the kind of conjuration I would have liked to have seen earlier, but there just wasn't time for the characters to grow organically. E.T. gets chopped up by Kuwabara so that he can pull himself back together, which is, you guessed it, another item on the fanservice checklist but without the spirit shards Kuwabara used to do it in the anime. Soon after, a metric fuckton of Makai insects escape from the wormhole Sakyo opened, but Koenma manages to temporarily contain them before they can make it into the city. And then Koenma reveals himself to Sakyo? And Sakyo acts as though this is also something he anticipated? But why would Sakyo have any reason to believe an entity like Koenma would grant him an audience? Maybe there's something I missed, but who even knows at this point? Koenma typically works behind the scenes to get stuff done, and during the Dark Tournament, he doesn't step out into the line of fire, so to speak, until the finals come and Sakyo proposes his wager. I'm not against these two confronting each other in this way, I just don't understand why Sakyo isn't even the slightest bit surprised by Koenma's arrival in this iteration. Once Kurama and Hiei arrive to assist Yusuke, Sakyo wagers his life on Tagoro to win, just like he does at the end of the Dark Tournament. 
Though, in that situation, him and Koenma gambling with their lives was more about their lack of combat skills since neither men were fighters. Hell, even with that in mind, Koenma acknowledges that if it came down to a one-on-one, -on -one, Sakio would beat him. Believe me when I say I know that there is absolutely no way I could ever beat Sakio in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Sakio wanted the final match of the tournament to be determined by Yusuke and Tagoro, a show of his arrogance since he was positive Yusuke couldn't win despite all the power they knew Yusuke had accrued since their last battle in Turukane's compound. Here, Sakio putting his life on the line is merely a byproduct of Koenma calling out the flimsiness of his original wager, which was that if Yusuke won, they'd shut down the wormhole machine. Koenma rightly scoffs at this and counters by saying Sakio could just build another machine at some point. This is the only reason the stakes escalate to the point at which Sakio's life hangs in the balance. Koenma says he's leaving the fate of the world in Yusuke's hands, but again, what has Yusuke accomplished that makes him seem capable of saving the world? In this entire series, Yusuke has defeated two... Count him, two enemies, both of which he took the struggle bus to victory. It would make more sense to just call the special defense force to handle the situation, considering this is very clearly the showrunner's way of meshing in the inciting incident of Chapter Black, which was a portal to Demon World opening up beneath a city. The three-on-one fight between Team Yurameshi and Toguro isn't as visually impressive or weighty as any of the one-on-one -on -one fights we've seen so far. The choreography lacks the stylish flair of the battles that came before it, which in turn leaves it feeling flat and toothless. There are plenty of cuts in the middle of the action, causing it to feel jumbled at times in a way that breaks up the connective flow. I'm not sure if the excessive cuts were a stylistic choice made by the editing team, or if they're being deployed tactically to hide the performance inadequacies of the actors and or in trying to keep the stunt team out of sight. The overall point being this particular fight is missing the same level of polish when measured against others in this same series. To bring this phase of the battle to a close, Yusuke queues up a spirit gun powerful enough to launch Togoro through the wall of the arena, but he comes stomping back into view, mildly inconvenienced at best. This is yet another callback to when Yusuke does the same thing in the Dark Tournament Finals. Seeing Kulbara and the ladies on his security monitor, Sakio routes them to the arena where they find Yusuke and the others in the aftermath of having the shit kicked out of them. E.T. shows up to mock the state of our, uh, heroes, and it dawned on me why E.T. kept triggering something in my brain on a visual level. He looks like he was animated by Capcom's RE engine, specifically the version used to build Resident Evil 7. Like he wouldn't feel out of place at all if you ran into him during your escape from the Baker Estate. Just like in the anime, E.T. is the one who breaks the news about Genkai's death. However, it's such a weird change that Yusuke would be the one kept in the dark here, which just mirrors how weird it is that they sped through his time with Genkai in the first place. Genkai's death was a big deal for Yusuke as it represented the loss of the first person who truly and openly believed in him that he also had a long-standing connection with. Him mourning her death and the burning anger it stoked in him for Toguro were major points of development. It was the first time we got to see Yusuke being that vulnerable in his grief in the direct aftermath of Genkai's murder. Yusuke's refusal to tell Kuwabara about Genkai came from a place of denial, not wanting to admit to himself that his mentor was, in fact, gone. On the flip side, Kuwabara being the original party left in the dark about her death was also important. Yusuke wasn't the only one Genkai was important to, and being purposely kept in the dark by the people he trusted because they decided for him that he couldn't handle the grim news was a slap in the face as well as a betrayal of the respect Kuwabara thought they had for each other. But the thing was, Yusuke didn't tell anyone. Karama and Hiei were able to determine for themselves what had happened based on Genkai's vanishing spirit energy. There's a lot to unpack when it comes to what Genkai's death means to Yusuke and how it affects everyone around him, including Botan. Yet here, all of the emotional tension and gravity is stripped out and instead, Genkai's death is positioned as nothing more than a reason to boost Yusuke's power enough to defeat Togoro. During E.T.'s story time, we're given what's undoubtedly the most offensive piece of CG in the entire series, and that's this young version of Genkai that looks like poorly generated AI art. It's such a strange choice when I'm sure it would have been easier and looked better to just slap a pink wig on a random extra that looked just enough like Genkai to make it work. It probably would have been cheaper, too. The tragic romance between Genkai and Toguro is also omitted from the story in favor of them just being friends, which removes another layer of characterization from both of them. E.T. then goes on to say that after giving Yusuke the Spirit Wave Orb, she foolishly challenged Toguro to a fight, but that's not correct. He showed up and challenged her. This might just be a script error, but either way, it's a weird thing to get wrong just two episodes later. Once the story wraps, Toguro kills his elder brother for seemingly no reason, saying something about not selling his honor after E.T. mentions they'd both pawned off their souls. In the absence of any true understanding of Toguro both as a person as well as an antagonist, his sudden aggression toward his older brother feels out of place, like there was something missing from the equation, and there very much is. The romance angle with Genkai combined with Toguro's motivations and fixation on Yusuke as a rival. See, in the anime, this moment plays out the way it does for two very specific reasons. The first is that during E.T.'s story time, where he's describing the past relationship between Toguro and Genkai, he says some disrespectful shit, alluding to the pair's sex life and how he wouldn't have minded having a past at Genkai. 
The nature and tone of which he decides to speak of Genkai angers Toguro since despite having recently murdered her, he still genuinely cared about her. So he was already irritated with his older brother, but what really pushed Togoro to assault E.T. was the fact that it was clear the elder Togoro intended to interfere with Togoro's fight against Yusuke. A fight, mind you, that he'd been anticipating since facing the spirit detective in the Rescue Yukina arc. Yusuke demonstrated the potential to rival and outclass Togoro, and this final battle was the culmination of his efforts to see if Yusuke was truly worthy of his time. E.T.'s intervention would completely undermine that and again, despite the heinous things Togoro has done, his honor would not allow their battle to become a two-on-one. As such, Togoro removes his brother from the situation, but the audience has enough information to understand why. Once this weird sequence concludes, we get a montage of Yusuke and Genkai with somber music trying desperately to tug on your heartstrings because it really wants you to care, but there's no reason to. Yusuke had very little true interaction with Genkai before she gave him the orb, and any connection we're supposed to assume they've built was done off-screen beyond the audience's reach. The show's emotional beats hinge on the hope that you as a consumer have a pre-existing understanding of the relationship Genkai and Yusuke are supposed to have. Yusuke gets mad and starts actually utilizing his spirit energy before mirroring the aerial attack Toguro attempted to drop on him earlier. This is the only instance in which Yusuke copies another technique the way Genkai foreshadowed. When Togoro re-emerges from the hole Yusuke put him in, he's in his powered up state and I genuinely hate this. What we're seeing is supposed to be his maxed out state and I think what's really ruining it for me aside from the bad CG is just how much it feels like the concept artist took inspiration from Attack on Titan. This looks like someone took the armor Titan without the bits that made it visually striking and slapped Togoro's head on it. He's not even rocking the weird muscular shoulder pads that made his design stand out. I think the flesh-colored skin is what's really holding it back though, since once Togoro went into the higher tiers of his power, his skin took on a sickly gray color that separated him even more from the humans and demons around him. It was a visual metaphor for the humanity he traded away in favor of power. Above all, the design had an intimidation to it that's just flat out missing here. That's not to say the makeup or CG couldn't have been done well. Just look at this piece of art made by Yoshihito Hiroshige four years ago. Sure, this isn't an actor, nor are we seeing it in motion, but just look at how well the design works even when removed from its original style and medium. The possibility was there, but it would have undoubtedly taken more money and a group of people in positions of power that gave an actual shit about Yu Yu Hakusho. Toguro begins trying to bring out Yusuke's full strength, but that thematic throughline doesn't exactly work in this reimagination of the series since we haven't heard any character talk about Yusuke's potential. What made this endeavor so enthralling in the anime was that we knew there was untapped power within Yusuke through things Genkai told him over the course of the series. And because of Yusuke's life, he'd put up a wall between his feelings and himself, severely limiting the upper ceiling to his power output. Remember, Genkai tells him that emotions are directly connected to the strength of one's spirit energy. And we spend the entirety of the anime up to that point watching Yusuke avoid his feelings and substitute them with sarcasm. So not only does it make more sense for anime to grow to acknowledge Yusuke's untapped potential, it's a massive part of Yusuke's development by the time those emotions walls do come down. Togoro levies the threat at Keiko and Yukina in the hopes it'll get Yusuke to step up to the plate. Hiei intervenes first and then Kuwabara does the same. This act of defiance from Kuwabara is what causes Togoro to choose him as his next victim. Once again, robbing a scene rich with emotional context of its weight. In the anime, Togoro chooses Kuwabara as his victim because he knows that Yusuke and Kuwabara are close after witnessing their teamwork firsthand. It's a very tactical choice, made in the hopes of getting the desired outcome. He even seems surprised when Yusuke doesn't react right away to his fallen ally. That's anticlimactic. You knew him for so long and now he's dead. Togoro impales Kuwabara, but we don't even get his mulberry as a tree line, which to be fair, probably would have annoyed me even more than its absence since this version of Kuwabara really isn't that guy. Instead, he's like, you're supposed to be stronger than this, Yurameshi, before getting got. But why? Why do you believe that, Kuwabara? Because he beat one demon to your knowledge and was given a magic bubble that seemingly had no immediately noticeable effects? We're then supposed to buy the fact that Yusuke is devastated by Kuwabara's death, but we've spent next to no time seeing these two be friends on screen. I can't even find the energy necessary to pretend to care about these characters or their interpersonal relationships. Yusuke says he's here to protect his friends, but he's not friends with Hiei, he's barely an associate of Kuwabara, who he now believes is dead, and he doesn't even know Yukina. Of the people here, Keigo is the only one he has a genuine friendship with that's played out on screen and referenced to in conversation. Hell, he's got a better connection with Karama than Kuwabara. And before I forget, like it's super easy to with this iteration, Yukina's rescue is a total byproduct of Yusuke wanting to rescue Keiko. 
It's wild how a transitional arc meant to set the groundwork for concepts like the Black Black Club, antagonists like Togoro, and Hiei's history were shoved into a blender and massacred until it became a bland paste for the showrunners to spoon feed the audience. Anyway, Yusuke queues up one final spirit gun to decide it all, just like the finale of the Dark Tournament. Togoro dispels it after a bit of struggle and then dies anyway like he's supposed to. Naturally, Kuwabara isn't dead, but what I don't understand is why this version of Togoro wouldn't actually kill him. In the anime, we know it's because Togoro never had any intention of killing Kuwabara. He simply wanted to make Yusuke think he did to provoke him into drawing out his untapped power. I'm struggling to find any reason why in this universe he'd allow Kuwabara to live. Yukina heads over to heal him, but like, where was that urgency when Kurama and Hiei, who were clearly on the same side as Yusuke, needed that same attention? At least in the anime, she was being held captive so she couldn't help. Here though, she just kinda stood around. Kuwabara has that moment with Yukina where he asks her not to hate all humans, despite the abuses she suffered at the hands of humans. I guess this is supposed to be the full circle moment for Kuwabara's arc, considering just a few episodes ago he was trying to prevent Yusuke from helping Kurama based on the pain and suffering caused by the Makai. But the Kuwabara we know was just an upstanding guy who knew there was plenty of bad people out there, but never let that stop him from recognizing the good that exists. It just came to him naturally. Sakio, having lost the bet he made, closes the portal and puts his own lights out. We get a scene between Togoro and Genkai in the afterlife that's emotionally hollow. The context of the scene in both this version and the anime is that Togoro is on his way to the worst possible hell and spirit world of his own choosing, as a way of further punishing himself for not only the things he did in life, but the things he failed to do. In the anime, the extra context of his relationships and how power corrupted him make for a melancholic but genuine send-off for this iconic character. It culminates in Togoro telling Genkai that had things gone differently, it would have been a beautiful life for them. Given the journey that brought the viewer to this point, this conversation between them where you genuinely see who Togoro is beneath the mask is poignant and bittersweet, made even more thematically and visually striking by the imagery of Togoro walking toward the place where he'll spend the next 10,000 years being endlessly tortured. There's so much missing to the live action iteration, but to be fair, how could they have possibly pulled this level of storytelling off in just 5 40-50 to 50 minute episodes? We also get a return of the absolute dogshit CG used to visualize young Genkai, and this is going to haunt my dreams. On the way out of the compound, Yukina confronts Hiei for no real reason about the fact she's searching for her long lost brother. In response, Hiei unveils and relinquishes his stone to her. Naturally, Yukina begins to assume that he's her brother, but Hiei shuts that down and acknowledges that he's a friend of the others. Setting aside the fact Hiei wouldn't say something like that in reference to anyone on Team Yurameshi except Kurama, it also doesn't make any sense for him to refrain from telling Yukina who he is. Think about the original reasoning for keeping his secret. In order to locate the stone he'd lost as well as the village he was cast out from, he required a Jigan implant, so he sought out the demon surgeon Shigure. Before Hiei could even get the surgery, he had to tell Shigure his life story in the hopes he would find it interesting. After successfully doing so, the price Shigure required was that Hiei could never tell Yukina who he was. It was a ferociously ironic price to pay, and Hiei agreed to it. For him, it was enough to know Yukina was safe and kind of watch over her from afar. No such restriction exists on Hiei in this version, since he gave himself the Jagan with the use of the Conjuring Blade. So for those who aren't familiar with the story as it originally stands, this probably feels like a deeply disappointing anti-climax to the one motivation Hiei has in this series. It basically tells the audience that the entirety of the Hiei Yukina plotline was pointless and only existed to get Hiei onto the team. The season ends with Team Yurameshi sailing back to mainland Japan, and Genkai just stays dead. There is a mid credit scene where we see E.T.'s head on the beach. He's alive and getting pecked at by a seagull, and I was honestly expecting to see a shadow walk up or hear footsteps, but I'm glad that didn't happen. This is a clear setup for Chapter Black, but I hope from the bottom of my heart that this show doesn't get a second season that allows them to massacre my favorite arc. And that's the entirety of the live action series. Before we end this video though, I want to lay out some final thoughts to really convey my overall sentiments of the show while taking a little time here and there to point out some things I enjoyed. Like I said earlier and reiterated several times throughout this video, this did not feel like an adaptation of the source material as much as it was a clear reimagining. However, that doesn't save it from criticism since so much of the story is based on you as a pre-existing fan, filling in most of the blanks with your knowledge of canonical events. Every episode is filled with callbacks and fan service, but that muddies the story in ways that make for a worse experience overall. Because the script wants so desperately to have those iconic moments without earning them, the pacing ping-pongs between feeling dreadfully slow to moving at breakneck speeds. There's no time for these characters to grow, be challenged, and ultimately change in complex and meaningful ways. There's no room for the story to just breathe and make every scene count while making sure the plot is sufficiently and coherently conveying all of the necessary information and context you require to become and remain invested. 
All of that is papered over in the hopes that you will be too blinded by the cinematic equivalent of key jangling to notice how poorly the story is being told. You can't skip over the storytelling that makes these moments shine and still expect them to have the same punch and gravitas with the audience that knows what these moments are supposed to represent. And I think that commitment to cramming in so many iconic moments very much hurt the story they were trying to tell. Even if you want to show some grace and give it a bit of wiggle room, it's tough to refrain from comparing the live action to the anime when it lifts so much imagery from the anime. Another thing I found lacking in the script was a sense of humor. Yu Yu Hakusho was not an exercise in depression and emotional suffering. It knew when to keep the tone dark and when to lighten it, but it also knew how to use humor as characterization, with everyone on Team Yurameshi having their own sense of humor that was a reflection of who they were as a person. It was also used when characters were trying to hide their stresses or concerns, sometimes to great success and other times to notable failure. The story took itself seriously when it needed to, but wasn't afraid to allow the cast to be reflexively or defensively funny. But let's move on to the casting and performances. To be honest, the performances didn't bother me all that much. My issues lie almost entirely on the choppiness of the storytelling. Despite him not feeling like Yusuke too terribly much in the grand scheme of things, I came to enjoy watching Takami Kitamura's portrayal. I found it to be serviceable and he was doing what he could with the material he was given. Shuhei Weisugi was also fairly entertaining as Kuwabara, again despite the fact he didn't really embody the spirit of the character, but that's a failing of the script and not the actor. I feel like Shuhei and Takami were the two putting the most energy into their performances whereas most of the remaining cast felt tame and flat almost. With the exception of the guy who played the Elder Tagoro, whose name I cannot find right now, so I'm just gonna throw it up on screen during editing, he was having a ball in a way that honestly made me wish he'd gotten more time to be a proper villain the way he is in the anime. That actor was doing a fine job. I know I spent a ton of time poking at the CG used for him, but that's a failing of the visual effects department, not the actor. I don't know if there are any actors I'd say were outright bad, maybe just kind of stale or lifeless, which unfortunately includes my boy Karama. Jun Shison's performance was incredibly dull and it's tough to know if that's solely the fault of the script or a result of the director's notes. Kanata Hongo as Hiei falls into that category too. Keita Machida who plays Koenma was fine, but he was mostly used as a vehicle for exposition rather than a fully fleshed out character with his own web of motivations and relationships. I'd have liked to see more of him doing behind the scenes stuff. But I suppose it's tough to elevate the material you're given when it requires you to spend most of your time standing around doing nothing. The only character I found myself getting even marginally annoyed with on a performance level was Botan, played by Kotone Furukawa. I don't know, something about it just kind of annoyed me towards the end of the season. It was reasonably tolerable at first, but there's just something about the performance I can't quite put my finger on that was slowly tipping the scales. I do believe that was 99% the script and direction, and maybe not necessarily the fault of the actress though. Everyone else was fine, I guess. Nothing stood out in a way that I feel requires me to spend time talking about it, so let's move on to the point of contention I've seen in every online discussion about this, and that would be the very, very condensed nature of the story. The argument I see in favor of the show is that people shouldn't be upset because they only had 5 episodes to work with, which is a bizarre defense. First and foremost, they didn't have to cram plot elements from 3 story arcs into 5 episodes, they chose to do that. They took and butchered elements from a huge chunk of the story. Why should we be praising or giving them a pass for that? How is that an achievement when it ultimately results in a worse product for the consumer? Not to mention, this show has been in development hell for years, to the point where a great many of us had either forgotten about it or thought it had been quietly cancelled. For the project to have spent as much time as it did in Purgatory, it should annoy you that it ended up as shallow as it did. I think this version of the show would have had much greater staying power for me if they had just treated it like they were trying to tell a long form story. Adapted arc by arc in a way that flows and allows for character development as well as informative world building. Just think of how many seasons we could have gotten from this if it was given to a team that cared. We could have had the first half of the Spirit Detective arc up to Rando, then the second half of the Spirit Detective arc going through Mei's castle culminating in the battle with Suzaku. That could have been followed by the Rescue Yukina arc in the first half of the Dark Tournament. An entire season could have been dedicated to just the second half of the tournament and all the craziness that goes with it. Chapter Black could have been split into two seasons, with the first half of the arc culminating in Kuwabara's kidnapping, and the second half closing out the arc with the showdown in Demon World and Ryzen's intervention. That just leaves the Three Kings arc, which could honestly probably fit into one season. That's at least 8 seasons to work with and if paced correctly, could have been done well. It could have even stayed between 5 and 8 episodes per season. The only thing required to make this dream work is a team of individuals with the patience and skill necessary to lay the groundwork and a real respect for the source material. Productions like these take time and cost a ton of money, so I understand wanting to hedge your bets in the way Netflix did. From a business perspective, condensing the show into one season was the safe move, but it certainly wasn't the correct move. 
We gotta keep in mind every decision made that led to the version of Yu Yu Hakusho we were given was motivated by money. Another argument I see against detractors is that we're just upset because we didn't get a one-to-one -one remake. I never understood why people equate wanting something true to the source material with wanting a shot-for-shot, word-for-word adaptation. I've never heard someone say that's what they wanted out of this series. That's not what I would want either. I wanted something that closely followed the source material but still had an identity of its own. You can convey the same story and themes in an adaptation without copy-pasting from one medium to another. It just takes good writers and studios willing to pay those writers. And while it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, let's look at how well HBO's The Last of Us series did. That wasn't a shot-for-shot, word-for-word adaptation, but they were still able to accomplish their goal of telling a story that was close enough to the source material that people enjoyed it. However, the quality of writers and the money HBO is willing to put behind production teams compared to what Netflix is willing to is night and day. The Last of Us still carried the heart and soul of the game through its narrative, which was the relationship between Joel and Ellie. A lot happens in the first game that was simplified or cut out altogether, but it maintained what made the story special. That's why I feel it's weird to assume people only wanted a perfect reflection of the source material. It's an argument from a place of bad faith, because you're essentially saying that the only options people should have are either a perfect recreation or a total bastardization. And I refuse to believe achieving a perfect middle ground that would please longtime fans while bringing new fans into the base was impossible. I truly believe there was a way to create something for everyone. But that's not the reality we reside in. It's perfectly understandable to really enjoy or really dislike this show. But what's unacceptable is to tell people on the other side that they're wrong for accepting or enjoying what was given, or wrong for being critical and dismissive about what was given. You're not a fake fan with trash taste if you like the show, and you're not a gatekeeping hater if you didn't like the show. What we should all be able to do as fans is come together and allow ourselves to be accepting and critical of this franchise we adore. Moving on though, the fight choreography for the most part was another upside to the show. I was kind of expecting it to be on par with something like Iron Fist, so I was glad to have been proven wrong. The violence was something that caught me by surprise, not because Yu Yu Hakusho itself wasn't violent, but because live action versions of things tend to tone down violence if there was any. I was glad to see the violence not only remained, but was even cranked up a bit to reflect just how brutal certain moments would come across in the real world. Uh, uh what else is there? That might be it in terms of things I genuinely liked. I'm not being facetious or putting on airs, I'm truly racking my brain trying to come up with more positive things to say about the show. My difficulty in finding positives to list out brings me back around to the same question I've been pondering since the completion of my first viewing. Who was this for? I just don't see the appeal in it as anything more than an interesting demonstration of how to make an adaptation of a beloved franchise that's soulless but just kind of okay. I know it might come across this way, but I actually don't hate this series. It was entertaining in the same dumb popcorn convoy as the first few Transformers movies. Aside from making this video, it's not going to occupy any space in my mind, which I honestly find to be worse than it just being flat out bad. But to say that it's terrible with no redeeming qualities would be disingenuous, it's just not what I was hoping to see. When I'm critical of something on my channel, with the exception of King's Game, it's not because I genuinely hate the thing I'm talking about. It's most often because I can see how easily the thing could have fully succeeded. For me, it means there was enough there to see the potential for something truly great. This is true for the Three Kings arc, it's true for Final Fantasy XVI, and it's true for this series too. My critical perspective comes from the belief that we as consumers deserve better. After all, it's our money going into these companies that make their endeavors possible to begin with. With that being said, Yu Yu Hakusho on Netflix for me gets a perfect 5 out of 10. It's a very average series that despite some of its positives, is held back from being anything more than mid by its total disregard for the story, the pacing, the character development, the soundtrack, basically everything. But again, it's not even close to the worst thing I've ever seen, and the actors all do a pretty solid job overall. If you're really craving more Yu Yu Hakusho content, this won't be the steak you're hoping for, but even SpaghettiOs taste divine when you're starving. If you hung out with me throughout this entire video, thank you so much, and another huge shout out to these wonderful folks for their continued support over on Patreon. A special shout out to Celestial Tier backers Angus Clydesdale, Super Sunset, and this one Snack. You are all very much appreciated, and I cannot thank you enough. If you'd like to see videos early, see your name in every video, or snag a portrait for the credit scroll, head on over to the Somewhere Past Never Patreon page where you can join for just $1. And remember, that gets you access to videos early and shoutouts in the credits on both of my channels. If there's anything you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to head over to my gaming channel where I do challenges and give me a subscribe. It costs you nothing and helps me out greatly. Remember to take care of yourselves and others. I hope your day's remainder becomes a turn in, and as always, thanks for watching.